May the Lord bless us as we study His Word. And I invite you, please, open your Bibles with me. And we will read from the book of Revelation, chapter 14, and verses 14 to 20. Revelation 14, 14 to 20. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud voice to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for the grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and the blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. After describing the three important messages of warning to be given to every nation, kindred tongue, and people. There is a description here about the coming of the Son of Man. In verse 14, it says that he was sitting on a cloud. This is very appropriate when we remember that Jesus, when he ascended to heaven, he also ascended in a cloud. And the angels that were present, they stated the like manner, as you have seen him going up to heaven, he shall come. And the description that uh, John gives about the coming of Jesus is very similar to that which we read in early writings, page 15 and 16. And I will read early writings, pages 15 and 16. Soon our eyes were drawn to the east, for a small black cloud had appeared, about half as large as an hand which we all knew was the sign of the Son of Man. We all, in solemn silence, gazed on the cloud as it drew nearer and became lighter, glorious, and still more glorious, till it was a great white cloud. The bottom appeared like fire. A rainbow was over the cloud. 
while around it were 10,000 angels singing most lovely song. And upon it sat the Son of Man. His hair was white and curly and lay on his shoulders, and upon his head were many crowns. His feet had the appearance of fire. In his right hand was a sharp sickle, in his left a silver trumpet. The trumpet in Jesus' hand is mentioned also by the Apostle Paul in the uh, epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians in 1 Ch Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16. It says that the Lord shall descend with the trumpet of God. But the sharp sickle that he has in his hand is a symbol of harvesting or symbol of reaping. And the angel <coughs> said to him, thrust in your sickle and gather the harvest because the harvest is ripe. Both in natural and spiritual realm, harvesting is done in two phases. Perhaps not so much today when they have modern equipment for harvesting, but in ancient times and even in the time when I was a child, we used to harvest in two stages. First, we went out with sharp sickle and we harvested, of course, we were planting rice, harvested the rice, made sheaves and heaped up and left there for a few days. And then later we were threshing and then we took the grain to the barn. Now, when does the harvest take place? The first part is taking place now. In early writings, page 88 and 89, I read this. I saw a little company traveling in narrow pathway. All seemed to be firmly united, bound together by the truth, in bundles or companies. Said the angel, the third angel is binding or sealing them in bundles for the heavenly garner. Today there is a harvest. The third angel is binding together the wheat to be taken to the heavenly garner. On page 118, same book, I read another statement saying, I then saw the third angel. Said my accompanying angel, Fearful is his work, awful is his mission. He is the angel that is to select the wheat from the tares and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garner. These things should engross the whole mind, the whole attention. So this is the first part of the harvest which is taking place now. But when the Son of Man will come in the clouds of heaven, then the harvest will be that the grain or the bundles that are bound already together, they are taken to the heavenly garner. Now, after John describing 
the coming of Jesus, he saw another angel. And this other angel, as we read here in Revelation 14, he came out of the temple and he said, in uh, verse 16, uh, verse 17, another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And then a, an other angel still comes out and says to this one that has the sharp sickle, thrust in your sickle and harvest the vine because the grapes are fully ripe. And interesting that between the harvest of the wheat and the harvest of the grapes, there is a difference. Because the wheat is harvested with all carefulness that no grain should be lost. And very carefully laid in heaps. But the grapes here that should be harvested they should not be heaped up carefully. It should be thrust into the wine press. The angel said, thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gather the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. What is a wine press? Of course, today they use modern methods of obtaining the uh, juice of the grapes. But anciently, they had a big container and they thrust all the grapes in there and the people were treading with their foot, their feet, uh, the grapes until all the juice came out. Now notice, if you have to tread and step on the grape. You don't need to be careful about placing there with all carefulness. It was thrust in the wine press. This wine press is called where the, the grapes are thrust in the wine press of the wrath of God. Now, what is the wrath of God? Revelation chapter 15, verse 1 says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So when is it that will come the wrath of God? When the seven last plagues will be poured out. Now the seven last plagues will not be poured out before the gospel is taken to all nations to gather together the wheat. But after the gospel reached every place. The everlasting gospel, the present truth, will reach every place of the earth. Then Jesus ceases his work in the heavenly sanctuary and probation closes. And after that time, there will be no more opportunity for repentance. 
because the wrath of God will come. Now, this wine press in the Bible is mentioned under other names. Let's open our Bibles in the book of Joel, chapter 3. Joel, chapter 3, verses 9 to 14. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Make up, wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye hidden, and gather yourselves together round about. Either cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the hidden be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. <coughs> the fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision here again is brought to view a harvest the sickle should be thrust in and harvest and in these Bible verses it's all ye hidden. The wicked will be harvested. And where will they be th thrown? Into a valley called the Valley of Jehoshaphat or Valley of the uh, Decision. And it says here that the press is full. In <coughs> Revelation chapter 14, we read in verse 20, the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press. Interesting, it is not the grape juice that will come out. Blood will come out. Because those grapes represent the wicked that will be gathered in the valley of Jehoshaphat. And they will be the ones that they will make implements of warfare. And they will turn their uh, plowshares into swords, their pruning hooks into spears. Here we understand that this event is connected with Balic movement, with war. And this press which is called the Valley of Jehoshaphat, is also called by Prophet Isaiah. Let's open the book of Prophet Isaiah, chapter 63, verses 3 and 4, and 6. 3, 4, and 6. Isaiah 63. 
I have trodden the winepress alone. And of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in my anger. And trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garment. And I will strain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I will tread down the people in my anger, and make them drunk in my fury. And I will bring down their strength to the earth. Now notice a similarity in uh, Revelation 1420 says that the winepress is the winepress of the wrath of God, where the grapes are trodden. And here in Isaiah says that I will tread the wicked in my fury, in my anger, or in my wrath. And this one that treads the winepress is none else but Jesus Christ. In Revelation chapter 19, we read about Jesus in verses 15 and 16. Revelation 19, 15 and 16. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with the rod of iron, and tr he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of the Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and of his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He treads the nations in his fierceness, in his wrath. This is why the wine press is called the wine press of the wrath of God, where the grapes will be tread. Interesting uh, titles given to that same wine press. Wine press of the wrath of God, the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of decision, press or wine press. And according to the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, verse 11, has another name for that press. Let's read Zechariah 12, 11. In that day, Shall there be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of Hadadrimon in the valley of Megiddon? <coughs> that same winepress of the wrath of God has also another title, Valley of Megiddon. <coughs> Actually, the valley of Megiddon is known today by the name of Har Magedon or Armageddon. <coughs> the word Armageddon comes from uh, two Hebrew words. Har, that means mountain. Megiddon means place of multitude. The uh, People will be gathered there in that valley. But who will be gathered there? The wicked. And they will be there. Now, uh, Armageddon is a place 
that um, the measurement is given in Revelation chapter 14, verse 20. How big is that space? Let's read Revelation 14, verse 20. A thousand six hundred furlongs. You know how big is that? Around 200 miles. The valley of Megiddon to there, representatives of the nations that are always ready for war will be summoned. And in Revelation chapter 16, we read verses 12 to 14. Revelation 16, Twelve to fourteen. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of East might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophets. For they are spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, of the whole world, to gather them together to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Verse 16, And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. The Greek word gather them together is sunago. And that does not admit the idea that the people will remain in their own place where they are, but they will be brought to a place. Of course, not everyone, but all nations will send their representatives to that place. And the word that we read, and they gather them together into a place that's called Armageddon. That word place in the Greek is topos. And from the word topos comes topography. It is a geographic spot in our planet. They gather them to that place. Who will gather them together? Spirits of demons. To the great battle. And that place is in the Middle East. And why is it that uh, the Middle East will attract so many representatives of the people? There are a few important points that we should consider. The place of Valley of Megiddon is in the Middle East. And the Middle East is the center of the, or the heart of the earth. The main canal that links east and west is there, the canal of Suez. <coughs> The richest resources of petroleum is there in the Middle East. Many years ago, perhaps we could not understand why, 
um, the nations would be attracted to the Middle East. But one of the attractions is this, the oil. But that's not all. You know that that sea contains chemicals that's coveted by all nations. Chemicals unexplored. Now, the wicked, not the righteous, will be in that great battle. It's called the winepress of the wrath of God, valley of Jehoshaphat, valley of Megiddon. Military forces will be summoned there who have swords and spears. The spirit of devils will summon them. And the battle will be fought in the time of the wrath of God, precisely under the outpouring of the sixth plague. <coughs> now, during the seventh, uh, during the seven last plagues, there is only one battle that is referred to, and that is the Armageddon. If you read carefully the outpouring of the seven last plagues, the first plague is blood. Um, the, the sea transformed into blood. The second plague, the rivers and fountains transformed into blood. No, sorry. The first one is um, source. Source. The second, the sea transformed into blood. The third one, the rivers transformed into blood. The fourth, the sun scorching people with great heat. The fifth is darkness. And the seventh is earthquake and hailstorm. All these six, the first to the five and the seventh, are elements of nature. Testimonies to ministers, page 444, says that the angels are holding back the winds. And these are, represent elements of nature and political strife. And the only pol one political strife is the sixth. And we will come uh, to uh, that point to read from the inspiration what is the Battle of Armageddon. You know the word Armageddon was not known for centuries to secular people. Only religious people knew those who read the Bible. But lately this term is known. You know uh, General MacArthur, he mentioned, and I quote his words, he said, We have had our last chance. If we do not now devise some greater and more equitable system, Armageddon will be at our doors. And uh, the noted British general, Sir Ian Hamilton, he declared the following. The spot where Europe may attempt to halt Asiatic penetration will become the last battlefield of all time and mark the end of civilization. I have looked carefully at the map and the best spot for Europe to meet and throw back Asia is called Megiddo or, in some maps, Armageddon. Even secular and political people, they know what Armageddon is. 
Now, the question, great question is, where will God's people be? The General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1951 made a decision that the youth, Seventh-day Adventist youth, should take active part in the battle that will be convoked by the spirit of demons. And this was published in the magazine Youth Instructor, right on the front page, April 1st, 1951. Where will God's people be in that time of the wrath of God? If they are taking active part in the Armageddon, they are lost. Because God is sending the plagues to destroy. Someone told me, oh, we are not going there to destroy or to kill. We are going there to save. Well, save those whom God is destroying. <laughs> God's people will not be there, either to kill or to save. Where will God be, people be in the time of the sixth plague, in the time of the wrath of God? Great Controversy 635 says, The people of God, some in prison cells, some hidden in solitary retreats, in the forests and mountains still plead for divine protection while in every quarter companies of armed men urged on by hosts of evil angels are preparing for the work of death. It is now in the hour of utmost extremity that the God of Israel will interpose for the deliverance of his chosen. Where will God's people be in the time of God's wrath? No one will be there in the valley of Jehoshaphat or in the wine press of the wrath of God. Because if they will be there, they will be trodden underfoot. They will be destroyed. But God's people, some will be in prison. Some will be on the mountains. Some on the forests, hidden pleading for the protection of God. They, this battle of Armageddon will be a battle of the kings of the east. All nations will have their representative there. I want to read a few statements about what do the worldly generals and military men do in uh, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, 363-364. Everything is preparing for the great day of God. You know, here is a confusion. Many people interpret that the Battle is God's battle. No, it's God's great day. But the battle is convoked by evil spirits, not convoked by God. And it says here, everything is prepared for the great day of God. Time will last a little longer until the inhabitants of the earth will have filled up the cup of their iniquity. And then the wrath of God, which has so long slumbered, will awake, and this land of light will drink the cup of his unmingled wrath. The desolating power of God upon the earth to rend and destroy. The inhabitants of the earth are appointed to the sword, to famine, and to pestilence. Very many men in authority, generals and officers, act in conformity with instructions communicated by spirits. You remember in Revelation, 
16, we have read that the spirit of demons will go to convoke them. And many generals, they will receive instruction that are communicated to them by spirits. The spirits of devils professing to be dead warriors and skillful generals communicate with men in authority and control many of their movements. One general has directions from this, these spirits to make special moves and is flattered with the hope of success. Another receives directions which differ widely from the one given to the first. Sometimes those who follow the directions given obtain a victory, but more frequently they meet with defeat. The spirits sometimes give these leading men an account of events to transpire in battles in which they are about to engage, and of individuals who will fall in the battle. Sometimes it is found to be as these spirits foretold. And this strengthens the faith of the believers in spiritual manifestations. And again, it is found that correct information has not been given, but the deceiving spirits make some explanation which is received. The deception upon minds is so great that many fail to perceive the lying spirits which are leading them on to certain destruction. And Bible Commentary, Volume 7, 967. And here you will see exactly what the Spirit of Prophet says about the Armageddon. It says, the nations of the world are eager for conflict, but they are held in check by the angels. When this restraining power is removed, there will come a time of trouble and anguish. Deadly instruments of warfare will be invented. Vessels with their living cargo will be entombed in the great deep. All who have the spirit of truth will unite under the leadership of satanic agencies. But they are to be kept under control till the time shall come for the great battle of Armageddon. Did you notice that? Warf implements of warfare will be invented. New weapons will be invented. Because the world are eager for war. And as uh, the prophet uh, Joel said, the weak will say, I am strong. But vessels will be entombed in the great deep. All these implements that they will invent will be kept in check. Until when? Until the great battle of Armageddon. When the Armageddon is uh, coming in verse 15 of Revelation 16, there is a warning that we should Hold fast and keep our garments because the Armageddon will come to an end. When the last plague will be poured out, God will say, Revelation 16, verses 16 and 17 and 18 says, God will say, it is done. The last plague is poured out. And soon after the plagues are poured out, what will happen to the inhabitants of the earth? Those are still alive. They will die by the brightness of the coming of Jesus. And their bodies, in Jeremiah 
you can take note. I'm not going to, to read. The time is over. Jeremiah 25 verses 30 to 33 says that their bodies will be left unburied, scattered on the surface of the earth. And then there will be a great feast of the birds. Revelation 19. Let's read this Bible verses. Revelation 19, verses 17 and 18. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that he may eat the flesh of kings and of flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Those carcasses will be eaten up by the birds. And after that, the birds themselves will die. And the prophet Jeremiah, looking upon the earth, at that time he says, I saw no man, I saw no bird, I saw no cities, all cities were destroyed. But during that time of great calamity, the time of the plagues, God will be the protection of his people. In Psalm 91 says that thousands may fall on one hand, ten thousand on the other hand, but you shall be protected. No plague will come to thy tent. Isaiah 26, 20 and 21 says, Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy door about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold... The Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. This is the invitation of the Lord. Come, my people, enter in thy secret chamber. Hide yourself until the indignation is past. And what is this secret chamber? It's God's protection. He that uh, <coughs> under uh, God's care, he shall rest under the power of the Almighty. And he will be protected. None of God's children will be affected by that great calamity. No one of God's children will be in the wine press of the wrath of God. They will be protected. And after all that happens, when Jesus comes, then he will take his own to the heavenly garner. May God help us that we may understand the prophetic line and what is ahead of us and be ready for those events. My wish and prayer. Amen. 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 Our gracious, merciful Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for Thy loving care. We thank Thee for Thy protection, Thy guidance, and also for bringing us together to study Thy Word. Lord, we know that troublous times are ahead of us, and we ask Thee to help us that we may in this time of probation be sealed and bound in bundles for the heavenly garner and we may be free from the great destruction that will come upon the earth in the time of trouble. We may be protected by thy grace. We ask to bless each one of us here present and bless those whom we represent and be with thy people wherever they are 
Give them the Sabbath blessings. Forgive us our sins, our mistakes, our shortcomings. Accept us as thy children, just as we are, and give us thy peace in our hearts. Dismiss us with the Sabbath blessings, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.